oh, on page R1. So the chordate animals are also known as the vertebrate animals. This is the last phylum, phylum vertebrata. We are now covering the last phylum of the animal kingdom. This is the phylum of animals we're most familiar with. All right, and so what are the characteristics? Bilateral symmetry. You'd say, what does that mean? We learned it last time I lectured. You can divide them into an equal right and left half, like us. If you ima imagine a, an imaginary cut right through my body, I got a right arm and a left arm, a right eye and a left eye, a right nostril and a left nostril, a right lung and a left lung. We're bilaterally symmetrical. We're going to skip what a notochord is, just ignore it. Vertebrates, vertebrate animals, including us, have a brain and spinal cord. And vertebrate animals, including us, have pharyngeal gill slits. Now, the word pharyngeal means throat. Now, an obvious question is, OK, fine, fish might have pharyngeal gill slits, gill slits in their throat, but why do you say us? We wrote, in aquatic organisms, what does aquatic mean? Water. Living in the water. The gills are used for breathing, to obtain oxygen and get rid of CO2 in terrestrial chordates or vertebrates. Terrestrial means living on land, like us, like your dog. The gill slit structures develop into the eustachian canals. And you might say, what the heck are eustachian canals? The eustachian canals, or auditory tubes, connect your throat, your pharynx, with your middle ear. The eustachian canals allow the air pressure to be equalized on both sides of your eardrum. And an infection of the eustachian canals is called an earache. So what, are, what actually start out as gill structures in a fetus develop into what are called the eustachian canals in us and in your dog. The eustachian canals allows the air pressure in the inside of your ear to be the same as on the outside. If the air pressure in your middle ear isn't the same as on the outside of your body, you'll experience a popping sensation. And you might be thinking, what is he talking about? You go down an airplane. The airplane takes off, and the cabin pressure in the plane changes. And most people start to experience a popping sensation in their ears. So what they tell you to do is to you know, pinch your nose and <clears throat> inflate your cheeks, chew gum, yawn. But you've got to move air from your throat through the eustachian canals into your middle ear to get that popping sensation away, to make it disappear. Uh, all that means is that the air pressure on the inside of your head is different than on the outside. And until it equalizes, and that's what the eustachian canals are for. Now, since these eustachian canals allow air to flow from your throat uh, to the middle ear, that's what we wrote, they connect the pharynx or throat to the middle ear, uh, and in, if you get a sore throat, an infection in your throat, it can spread up the eustachian canal into your middle ear. What do we call an infection of the eustachian canals in middle ear? An earache. That's a middle ear infection or an earache. So that means it's infected in that canal between your throat and the middle ear. And that hurts, like earache. Um, all right, so that's what those gill structures develop into. Uh, we're going to skip the next page, and on R3, on R3, so the vertebrates or vertebrate chordates, there are only 45,000 species. You don't have to know that, but you know that's really amazing. We said there's over 900,000 species of insects. And there's only 45,000 species of all the animals we're most familiar with. And most of them, incidentally, would be fish. So there's really not that many. The, the, the vertebrates include the fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. These are the animals we're most familiar with. Some additional characteristics is they have a vertebral column, which is the internal skeleton, the internal skeleton. Not only do we have an internal skeleton, 
for the vertebral column, so do fish, so do reptiles, so do birds. Uh, the two pairs of appendages, pectoral and pelvic appendages. The word pectoral means shoulder. There's appendages attached to the shoulder. There are appendages attached to the pelvic or hips. Now in fish, they have, they have fins attached here and here. Uh, but in animals that live on land, uh, we've got appendages, arms or legs, at the shoulder area and the hip area. Uh, a closed circulatory system, vertebrate animals, the blood flows from arteries, through capillaries, through veins. That's called a closed circulatory system. And the red blood cells, uh, uh, that uh, are their job is to transport oxygen. And the white blood cells, their job is to protect us against disease. The, all these vertebrate animals, including us, are dioecious. That means literally two types. You'd say, what do you mean two types? <clears throat> Male and female. Those are the two types. Remember the story of Noah. Right, so on page uh, R5, on R5, so this is uh, the only other phylum where I'm going to divide it into classes. So there's two phylum I'm dividing into classes. One was the arthropoda, which included the uh, uh, crustaceans, spiders, and insects, rachnids. And this, we're going to give you the name, class names for the different members of the vertebrate phylum. So the first is class chondrichthys. Class chondrichthys. Now, ichthys is a Greek root that means fish. And chondro means cartilage. So these are the cartilaginous fish. And that's because their skeleton is made up of cartilage and not bone. This includes the sharks, the skates, and the rays. So they have a skeleton. Their bones are not made out of bone, but actually cartilage. They have exposed gill slits. When you draw a picture or see a picture of a shark, it's got these gill slits. You can see them, and they're exposed. And its mouth is located on its ventral or belly side. We always put its mouth down here. Now, let me just contrast a shark just from its appearance. So let me repeat. It's got a skeleton made out of cartilage. It's got exposed gill slits, and its mouth is here on the belly side. Look on page R7. This is a true fish, R7. So in a true fish, its bones, its skeleton is made up of bone, not cartilage. And can you see this thing right here called an operculum? This covers the gill slits. Now some of us might be thinking, I don't know what he's talking about. If you've ever had goldfish or anything like that, anybody notice this thing kind of flapping on the sides of the fish around its cheek? That's the operculum, and the gills are right underneath it. So in other words, the operculum covers the gill slits. In the shark, which we were just looking at, there is no operculum or covering. The gill slits are exposed. Furthermore, in the mouth, the mouth of a fish is right here on the front. The mouth of a shark is on the belly side. It's not on the front. So did we just notice the difference in the position of where the mouth is. Is it right at the front of the face, or is it kind of on the bottom side? Now, going back, uh, here's where I drew it. Amazing. Look at the quality of this art. <laughs> All right? So when kids draw a shark, they're going to draw the mouth of the shark down here. But you draw a picture of the mouth of a regular fish, you draw it there. Um, th we wrote that the sharks are vicious predators. Here's something very interesting. You know, most living things are eaten by other living things, right? They, they have, uh, there's whatever uh, exists, there's some other animal that will eat it, except two, two organisms. Sharks and us. Sharks don't have any natural predators. Big sharks may eat smaller sharks, but there's no other species of animal that eats sharks. 
And there's really no other species that eats humans, but humans may kill other humans. So in that respect, we're like sharks. Sharks are like us. They'll kill each other, but they don't have any natural predators. Okay. Who's out hunting humans, other than maybe other humans? Most other animals are fearful of man. If you're out in the woods and you're worried about bears, you know what they tell you to do? Sing. Because most animals, if they hear a human, they run away. They don't, they're frightened of us. Why? Because, you know, we have weapons. All right, so the, most animals, if you make noise, they won't attack. They'll only attack us if they're frightened, if they're startled. And, and, and so if you make noise and they hear you're coming, they move away from us. They don't go towards us. They don't go, oh my gosh, a, a, hungry, a tasty human to eat. Okay, that, so they don't really, we're not eaten by anything. Uh, same thing with sharks. On the uh, next page, uh, nothing you have to know here, but this is a, uh, a, at the top of the page, these are called rays. And I'm, you don't have to know the difference between a skate and a ray, but you've all heard of a manta ray and a sting ray. And what these look like, these are relatives of the shark. Their mouth is on the underside, and their the pectoral fin, this is the large pectoral fin, is so big that it almost appears to fly through the water, if you see them in the aquarium uh, uh, facilities, like Long Beach Aquarium. Uh, the, uh, there is a ray that uh, generates an electrical current uh, in its muscles. All of our muscles generate electrical currents, but this one generates a really high electrical current. How much? You don't have to know this. A thousand watts. That's called an electric ray. And it kills its prey that way. On page uh, R7, on R7, this, so the class of real fish is called osteichthys, which literally means bony fish. Those are the true fish. They have, uh, they're characterized by having uh, that operculum that covers their gill slits. Now, how do gills work? Uh, the vertebrate animals uh, are called that because they have a vertebral column. And they include, and we covered this last time we, uh, 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 last lab, they include class chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fish like sharks and rays. They include class osteichthys, those are the true bony fish. They include class amphibia, the amphibians, which are like frogs and toads. They include, what right now what I'm covering right now, the reptiles. And uh, the reptiles, as we t mentioned last uh, lab, are believed to have evolved from an amphibian ancestor. Uh, the problem with amphibians is they're tied to the water because the embryo develops in the water. And then it has to undergo metamorphosis before it can go onto land. So the reptiles don't have to be born in the water. We're going to see why they don't in a moment. There, at one time, there was all these huge uh, reptiles. They were called the dinosaurs. Uh, all of them are extinct, uh, but these are the remaining survivors of reptiles. The largest reptiles today are the alligators. And uh, incidentally, we always think of alligators and crocodiles. Everybody says, oh yeah, like yeah, you know, Nile River, Egypt, right? Like Africa. Uh, we've got alligators and crocodiles in the United States. I always forget that, living in California. They've got alligators all over the place, in Texas, and Mississippi, and Alabama, Louisiana. They're all over the place. And they've got crocodiles in Florida, as well as alligators, in the Everglades National Park. So you don't have to go to Africa to see uh, crocodiles and alligators in the wild. Uh, snakes are reptiles, and turtles are reptiles. They're not amphibians. We mentioned that last time, because uh, they don't undergo metamorphosis. Um, on uh, page R17, and where we finished off last time, we, these, there's nothing you need to know on R17, nice pictures of dinosaurs. Uh, on the bottom of R17, nothing I will test you on, but if you want to know the difference between an alligator and a crocodile, you can read about it, and it shows both an American alligator and an American crocodile. It has to do with the shape of their snout. The alligator's got a uh, wider snout that the uh, crocodile. Anyhow, I'm not testing on them. On R18 are pictures of different reptiles. Fine. On R19, what are the characteristics of reptiles? 
Uh, number one, they have waterproof skin. Uh, that's, uh, that's not so they don't get wet when it rains. The purpose of waterproof skin is so that they want, when they're out in the hot sun, the waterproof skin keeps the water in their body and prevents it from evaporating. And we have somewhat waterproof skin, so we can lie out in the hot sun, right, by a pool or by the ocean, and we don't get dehydrated so quickly. That's the purpose of waterproof skin. Because reptiles do have that waterproof skin, though they use it to make, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, snake skin uh, purses and alligator purses, and uh, they use the skin of the reptiles for uh, different types of, uh, you know, purses and belts and shoes. Anyhow, uh, they, have, they were the first animals to have a palate. We learned that the palate separates the uh, mouth from the nose, so the animal can both uh, eat food and breathe at the same time. Amphibians don't have a palate. So they have to, if they're eating, they're not breathing. If they're breathing, they're not eating. They have to do one or the other at any time. Uh, they have well-developed lungs. They have internal fertilization. What does that mean? That means the male reptile has a penis. And it inserts it into the body of the female to fertilize her eggs. Uh, <clears throat> the most important thing that I want you to know about reptiles, though, is the amniotic egg. And uh, it's uh, pictured on page R20, on R20. And this is the most important thing of reptiles. The egg of a reptile is absolutely essentially the same as a bird egg. So as I describe the egg of a reptile, I could be describing an egg of a bird. Okay, uh, I want you to know this and I'll, you'll understand why and this is more important than you might think in just a moment. The reason why reptiles don't have to develop in the water like frogs do is because they develop inside this, this egg in an artificial water environment. The, the embryo reptile develops in a fluid-filled sac called the amniotic sac. And so do humans. That, we use that same term. A human baby develops in an artificial fluid environment called an amniotic sac. Now, in reptiles and in birds, they need nourishment to grow. This is what the yolk sac is for. That contains the nutrients. All embryos, all living things, produce waste. And we don't want these waste products accumulating right where the embryo is, so the waste products are stored in this allantoic sac. The allantoic sac stores the waste products. So far, we've mentioned three sacs. The embryo is in the amniotic sac for growing. The yolk sac has the nutrients. The uh, amniotic sac, I'm sorry, the allantoic sac stores the waste. These three sacs are surrounded by a larger outer sac called the chorionic sac, or chorion. So the chorionic sac is the sac that surrounds those other three. And yes, human babies are surrounded by a chorionic sac. I'll explain that in a moment. Now, just to complete this story, then there comes the egg whites, which are made up of a protein called albumin, and then the shell is the outer part, the shell. Now, the only difference between a reptilian egg and a bird egg is the shell. The uh, bird egg has a shell made out of calcium, so it's kind of brittle. A reptilian egg, its outer shell actually feels just like the skin of a, a reptile. It feels like the same way it's soft. It's like the skin of a lizard uh, or a snake. Other than that, the egg is the same. This basically allows, allowed reptiles where they didn't have to live anywhere near water because literally the embryo develops in this artificial water environment inside the egg. Now to add to your collection, at the bottom of the page, it shows two Galapagos tortoises getting it on. Previously, we've seen insects, uh, grasshoppers mating, earthworms mating. Here's uh, tortoises. I guess why I went into biology is that's all they talk about is reproduction. Um, anyhow, uh, on, uh, on page R21, R21, uh, I'm not, I won't ask you anything about snakes. If you're really interested in about snakes, you can read about it. They are kind of weird. They, of course, are reptiles that no longer walk with legs. They crawl on the land. Uh, they, um, 
They, do, they uh, basically are uh, deaf. They cannot hear anything. Uh, they do not speak. They have no vocal cords. Their eyes are always open. They have a lot of weird things. Uh, they fall into two major groups of snakes. There are those that kill by strangulation. These are the really big snakes like anacondas and uh, uh, pythons. Thank you. And then there's the snakes that kill by poison. And that includes rattlesnakes and cobras and uh, vipers. And so again, you can read about it. The, the snake venom is actually uh, produced by a modified salivary gland. So instead of producing saliva, it produces poison or venom. And then it injects it. The uh, poison kills by either causing uh, paralysis or by causing massive internal bleeding. Again, I'm not going to test you on it, but if you're interested, you can read about it. Okay, well, that takes us to page R23. On R23, well, R22 is aves, class aves. Aves means to fly. These are the birds. That's why you've heard of aviation. If you're an aviator or involved in aviation, you're involved in flight. Now, incidentally, do all birds fly? No, no they don't. An ostrich is way too heavy to get off the ground. It has wings, but it cannot fly. Um, another example, on R23, not only can an ostrich not fly, it's too big, penguins can't fly. They use their wings for swimming. Just all kinds of weird things. But the characteristics of birds, and they're believed to have evolved from reptiles, if you've ever seen the feet of a chicken, for example, they're all scaly, just like the scaly skin of lizards. Have you ever seen like a, a, a turkey or a, a chicken or the, any, any bird, their, uh, their legs are scaly like a reptile? Uh, all birds have wings. Uh, incidentally, uh, birds are not the only animals that have wings. Flies have wings, right? Insects have wings. They, they fly. But what's unique about the wings of birds is they have feathers. Feathers are believed to be modified scales uh, from the reptiles. They have a lightweight skeleton. Uh, that's why, you know, when you get uh, like KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken or something, you can just eat right through the bones because they're so soft. You can't do that with a, a, a bone of a, of a cow, right? But uh, bir bones of birds are very light so they can fly. They're not, not heavy. Anyhow, in R24, uh, birds are, uh, maintain a constant body temperature just like we do, just like mammals. They have a four-chambered heart, just like we do. Earlier today, we talked about right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. That's four chambers. And the birds have four-chambered hearts. Uh, internal fertilization. But the most important thing about the birds is the amniotic egg. They have produced an egg just like a reptile does. If you uh, look on page R26, on R26, it basically shows you a chicken developing, and everything on this picture on R26 of a chicken, a chicken egg is absolutely identical to that of the reptilian egg that I walked you through. Um, you can see the little chick or any other bird develops in this amniotic sac. It gets its nourishment from the yolk. You've all had the uh, yolk from a, ch uh, a chicken egg. Uh, there is an allantoic sac that stores the waste, and uh, it, those three sacs are surrounded by the chorionic sac. So the, uh, the better picture was that one on the reptile. That was cl more clear. Uh, on the, uh, what I've written next on R26 and R27 are bird stories. If you're interested, you'll read about them. If you don't care, I don't care, so uh, you don't have to know them. Uh, on R29, so the last class of mammals, and the last thing we're talking about, mammals. Uh, now, I will say this much about uh, different kinds of uh, animals. You know, some of us have uh, fish as pets, right? Some have birds. Uh, some, some people have reptiles, amphibians, reptiles. Some have birds. Anybody have uh, like a parrot or a canary or uh, anything like that? Uh, a parakeet? 
All right, then, uh, but the, our favorite pets are other mammals. And I'll tell you why, I think there's two things going on as far as why we choose the pets we do. Most people, the pets they choose are like dogs and cats and bunny rabbits and things like that, uh, hamsters. Here's why I think. There's two things going on. First, we like furry. We like furry. Well, we like to pet fur, all right? Now, uh, if we think of a fish, it doesn't have fur. And uh, an amphibian, a frog skin, it's not furry. We don't like that. And, and a reptile doesn't have fur, scaly. Now, birds, it's a little bit better. They've got kind of, you know, feathers. Feathers, you know, are a little bit better than scales. But the best, we like fur. You know, I think that we just like, if you have a pet, you know you always like to pet that fur. But there's something else that's deeper that I think is going on, even deeper than the idea we like petting fur. We notice the way the parents treat their young. Now, fish just release sperm and eggs into the water, and the embryos form in the water. They, the parents, parent fish have nothing to do with raising baby fish. The same thing is true with frogs. They just form, release sperm and eggs into the water. A, 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 a tadpole grows in the water. It has nothing to do with the adult frog. Reptiles, when a, a snake or a lizard or a turtle lays its eggs in the sand, you know what the mother does after it lays its eggs? It walks away. It has nothing to do with nurturing or caring for its young. They don't care for their young. Birds we start to like a little bit better because we know that the mother bird sits over those eggs and protects them. And after the little baby birds hatch, they bring food to those baby birds. And they teach the baby birds how to fly. This is called nurturing. What even nurtures more are mammals. In the case of your dog or cat or hamster, when they give birth, all right, first the baby grows inside the mother. But then after they give birth, the baby nurses or suckles on the mother's breasts, all right, the mammary glands. And the mother cares for the young. And I think that it, besides the furry part, we understand what nurturing is. And we understand that other mammals nurture like humans do. And that's what we like about dogs and cats and hamsters. And you don't see that with reptiles. Okay. So anyhow, that's my thought on that. Now, uh, interestingly, while there are not that many species of mammals, they are found everywhere. They are found on land. They're in the trees, like squirrels and monkeys. They're found under the ground, like gophers and moles. Those are mammals. They are found uh, flying. Bats are flying mammals. So they're found in every part of the environment, even though there's not that many species of them. They're believed to have evolved from a reptilian ancestor. On page R30 are pictures of different mammals, including bats. Also, another thing, on page R31, on R31, mammals vary tremendously in size. You don't have to know this, but there are mammals that weigh one-tenth of an ounce. And the largest animals that live are not dinosaurs. So next time your 10-year-old nephew or son is talking about dinosaurs, you tell them this. You know, dinosaurs were really big. They go, yeah. And you say, you know, the biggest living thing that ever lived, they say, yeah, is still alive. It's called a blue whale. Blue whales are far larger than even a brontosaurus dinosaur. Uh, a blue whale can be 150 tons. Its heart may be weigh itself, just the heart, 1,500 pounds. We can't even imagine that size. 100 feet long. So the biggest animals that ever lived are mammals, not dinosaurs, not reptiles. Mammals have hair or fur, as I was just describing. Uh, now, of course, we don't have a lot of hair on our body. But we actually have more hair than, say, whales do. So we are not the most you know, hairless of all the uh, mammals. Four-chambered heart, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Diaphragm muscle, which we've learned, used for breathing. Red blood cells that carry oxygen, homeothermic, we maintain a constant body temperature of about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. 
internal fertilization, the male has a penis and inserts it into the vaginal or vaginal canal with the female to fertilize the eggs. On R31, uh, on R32, a placenta. Now we, let me explain a placenta. Let's look at this picture. We're almost done. Let me first explain on this picture, this is an amniotic egg on the left, and this is a human baby growing on the right. Let's let, remind you of this amniotic egg. We just showed you that in an, a reptilian egg and a bird egg, the embryo develops inside a fluid-filled amniotic sac, right? Then we said it gets nourishment from a yolk sac, right? Then we said the waste products are stored in the allantoic sac, and we said surrounding those three sacs, represented by this thick black line, is the outer chorionic sac. Is everybody okay on that? Now let's see what happens in a human baby. The human baby develops in a fluid-filled amnionic sac, exactly like here. But notice that, and notice surrounding the amnionic sac is a thick black line representing the outer chorionic sac. The chorionic sac of, a, of, a, of the mammal forms these villi, these finger-like projections that become what's called the fetal portion of the placenta. There is an umbilical cord extending from the human baby or from any other mammal, and inside that umbilical cord are blood vessels, and these blood vessels extend out into these chorionic villi or projections. That's how the blood gets from the baby, the embryo, to this placenta. There are blood vessels that grow in the endometrium, there's the word, endometrium of the uterus. We talked about this earlier today. All right, that's the maternal portion of the placenta. So the placenta is actually where the blood vessels of the mother and the blood vessels from the baby, they don't connect, but they come very close. And this allows oxygen and nutrients to go from the mother's bloodstream to the baby. And waste products go from the baby to the mother. So, therefore, there isn't a need for a yolk sac or an allantoic sac, is there? Because unlike the reptile or bird egg, which needed nourishment and a place to store waste, the, uh, the nourishment for a mammal, including a human, it'll get it from the mother and get rid of the waste that way. Nevertheless, there is a yolk sac, and there is an allantoic sac even in a human baby, but they don't have any function. So they are inside the umbilical cord collapsed. They form, but they are not used. So the important point here is this. There are two sacs surrounding a mammal, the, uh, 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 including a human. There is an amnionic sac surrounded by an outer chorionic sac. There is no need for a yolk sac or an allantoic sac, even though they form, because that has, so those roles of a yolk sac and an allantoic sac have been replaced by a placenta. It's going to get its nourishment from the mother's bloodstream. All right, so that's called the placenta. Okay, and then as we wrap up, everything that's written on this page is exactly what I just told you. So you should understand what a placenta is. That's where the exchange occurs between the mother's bloodstream and the baby. On R33, we're actually going to get out early. You'd say, how early? Okay, five minutes away. All right, so uh, just a matter of about three minutes away. Okay, uh, they're mammary glands. Not only does the, uh, in, in mammals, that includes all mammals, humans, dogs, cats, rabbits, not only does the baby grow inside the mother, but after the baby is born, it is nourished by the mother as it nurses on the breast. These are called mammary glands. They're only functional in women, not guys. And that's why this class of vertebrate animals is called mammalia, because they have mammary glands and they nurse their young. 
Also, mammals have highly developed nervous systems. They, uh, they have much more complex behavior and thinking. You can't teach bird, you can't teach insects anything. You can't, you can't really teach birds anything. You can't teach reptiles anything. But you can teach mammals. You teach your dog, you teach your cat, right? You can train elephants. So mammals have a sophisticated nervous system. And uh, nurturing of the young lasts, I wrote, two to three decades. Actually, probably more than that in humans. Every time that your parents think you've gone, you come back. So the, um, the, uh, so in other words, unlike other animals which don't care for their young, in the case of mammals, they care for their young. And in the case of human mammals, they care for their young their whole life. It never ends. You can always, anytime you need more money, you still come to back to your parents and ask them for money. All right, so um, they may not give it to you, but you might still think of asking. OK, now, uh, the, uh, we're going to finally finish uh, mammals by dividing them very quickly into three subclasses. There's some really weird mammals. They're mostly found in places like Australia. There are egg-laying mammals, mammals that lay eggs. Instead of the baby developing in the uterus or womb, they lay eggs. You'd say, which mammal does that? There's a picture of yeah, the duck-billed platypus. And it's pictured on R34. When they first discovered it in Australia, they thought it was a joke. They couldn't believe it. It has, it looks like it has a bill like a duck. It is covered by fur, so it's a mammal. But it lays eggs like a bird. And then it has mammary glands, and it nurses the young after it hatches. It's really weird. It's found in Australia. the duck-billed platypus. So that's an example of an egg-laying mammal. All right, now, back on R33, there are the pouched mammals. These are also more primitive than most mammals. They are the ones, mammals with a pouch. The most famous one is a kangaroo. I think everybody knows that the baby kangaroo is in the pouch of the mother for a while. You know what it's doing in the pouch? That's where the nipples are. It's nursing in the pouch. So it nurses in the pouch, but that's a more primitive mammal. Not only are kangaroos pouched mammals or marsupials, wallabies, koala bears, wombats, Tasmanian wolves, they all live in Australia or weird places like that. The only one that lives locally that we're familiar with is that ugly animal we know mostly as roadkill. Opossums are pouched mammals. They are marsupials. That's called subclass marsupial. OK, that's a. Uh, and, but the third subclass, and the most important, are the true placental mammals. These are the mammals we're most familiar with. Doggies, kitty cats, rabbits, uh, bears, monkeys, deer, bats, cows, horses, seals, whales, sloths, elephants, and man himself is a placental mammal. And they have a placenta. So uh, we have finished uh, the, uh, we've, we've ta talked about today, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And I think that of all the things I spoke about, what I think is among the most important that I spoke about on these last subjects was the amniotic egg. There was a good picture of the amniotic egg on R20. All right? And then the real reason why I wanted you to know the amniotic egg isn't because I'm trying to emphasize birds and, and reptiles. It's because on R32, I wanted you to understand how a human baby develops and understand there's an amniotic sac and an outer chorionic sac. Those of you who have me for lecture have learned that the outer chorionic sac secretes a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, which is what they test for to see when a woman is pregnant. And that's produced by this outer sac. It enters the mother's bloodstream. All right, so uh, we got three minutes early. OK. So uh, that's it. Uh, again, focus on section U. I think it's the most important of all the sections.